Thank you, Jose, and thank you to the education faculty for this uh, honor and opportunity to be with you. Thank you to, to John McLaughlin for kind of uh, planting a seed, I think, and it's really wonderful to have that seed come to fruition and to be with you this evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. So uh, the title, as uh, Jose said, is Storying Our Lives. I'm already violating some grammatical rule by turning the word story into a sort of a verb. But it's because uh, I, I really believe that there is a, a process that we're all involved in uh, from, from day one, and it involves storying our lives. So that's why uh, I've got that word up there, a narrative approach to adult development and aging. Um, there's a lot of interest these days in stories and uh, narrative. Uh, you hear the word narrative uh, used in a lot of different contexts, in the media, by journalists, and so forth. So um, I guess the question is, where is all this interest in narrative coming from? Narrative, a word I'm going to use kind of interchangeably with story, although 
there are uh, you know discussions as to well narrative is not quite the same as story but for the purposes of this evening I'm going to kind of lump them together if you don't if you look in the dictionary under narrative the first meaning you're going to have is story and vice versa uh, so I'd like to try to provide a little bit of context from my perspective only uh, as to uh, what's behind uh, what's been called or being called the narrative term which I happen to think is one of the very interesting, exciting intellectual developments in the last couple of decades. Some would say it even constitutes a bit of a paradigm shift, but that's kind of a grand uh, way to think of things. But it is, it's a very interesting uh, way of looking at light, the universe, and everything. And I want to give you a, a bit of a taste for, for why I feel it's important. So some of the topics that I hope to uh, get through with you this evening, narrative across the human sciences, narrative gerontology, which is my own particular area, and then three or four intertwining concepts that I often work with in, uh, in my writing and teaching and workshops and so forth. These are concepts that I keep coming back to. They may not be the, the best concepts, but I present them to you in kind of an open-ended manner if they help you in thinking through some things that you're working on or some topics you're considering, then great. So the, the topics are narrative identity, narrative development, narrative environment and narrative challenges. And if there's time, uh, we could look a little bit at narrative care and narrative self-care. But uh, I'm sure that we'll be mindful of the time. I have a tendency to wander, which is why it's important for me to try to stick to, uh, to uh, my PowerPoint slides. You have copies of those uh, there in front of you. So let's start with a quotation by Monsieur Jean-Paul Sartre. I'm a collector of quotes. I sometimes think that anything that I've published is just a, a collection of quotations that I've tried to figure out a way to link together in what will pass as a logical sort of uh, fashion. But he says in his book, La Nausée, or Nausea, uh, a man, person, whatever, is always a teller of tales. He lives surrounded by his stories and the stories of others. He sees everything that happens to him through them, and he tries to live his life as if he were recounting it. Sorry, that's my very bad Paris Parisian accent. <laughs> so that's Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, so let's kind of look at the broad picture. Um, narrative across the social sciences, or some are referring to them as the human sciences. Um, actually, I'm quite pleased to bring along with me this evening a very recent publication. It's hot off the press. Some of you may be aware of it. It's the Rutledge uh, International Handbook on Narrative and Life History. And I'm pleased to report that our own Clive Baldwin, Canada Research Chair in Narrative Studies at St. Thomas, has a chapter in here, as does Will Van de Doener. So uh, I'll leave this here for, uh, for, uh, for the remainder of the evening, and you can have a look at it. It's a very interesting compendium of essays and articles by people in a variety of disciplines uh, who uh, are finding a narrative perspective relevant and important. Uh, the narrative term probably, I think of it as having kind of got its start within the field of psychology, uh, but it has uh, spread. Uh, you'll you'll, you'll uh, hear of narrative scholars in the field of sociology, also theology. In my theological studies years ago, I was very interested in something that was being called, and still is being called, narrative theology. Uh, neurology, you uh, we'll can read neuroscientists reflecting on the, the, uh, the neuroscience of story making, um, which uh, is, seems to be a central part of our brain functioning. I'm not a neuroscientist, I probably need one, uh, but uh, I'm sure you have much greater expertise in such areas than myself. Narrative medicine, there's a program at Columbia University uh, in narrative medicine, and of course education. Um, and here we have figures like Jerome Bruner, who kind of crosses uh, the border between uh, psychology and education, plus a number of other fields. Gene Clandinen, Michael Conley, uh, and uh, Richard Hopkins, uh, Martha Rossiter, and the list goes on. And I got my start in the uh, field of narrative through my studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. So I'm very grateful for my education connection. In fact, the first time I got a an opportunity to teach a course in this area was here in this uh, faculty. Uh, Dorothy McCarricker invited me to teach a summer course uh, on narrative, knowing, and learning. So I thank you and I thank Dorothy for that opportunity. So uh, what I call the narrative variable 
has been brought to bear upon our understanding of basic cognition, the thinking process. Uh, Jerome Bruner uh, coined a very famous distinction between what he called logical thought and narrative thought. And he says that most of the time in everyday life, we think in terms of story. We understand ourselves and the events of our lives in terms of the stories that we compose. The narrative complexity of our emotional lives is an area that I'm particularly interested in. Our identity, I'll get to that shortly. Personality, our relationships, the narrative complexity of friendship, of love, of romance, uh, the narrative complexity of our beliefs and values. Um, so, uh, as a book like I just showed you will reflect, uh, the narrative variable is being brought to bear on quite a number of topics that are central to who we are as human beings. And as human beings, I like to say that we are hermeneutical beings. Well, that's a word from uh, theological circles. Uh, we are meaning makers in a way that squirrels and chickadees tend not to be, or at least I don't think they are. I watch them come to my feeder and fight it out with each other, and I don't see a lot of meaning making going on, but then that's my human prejudice. But certainly, we human beings are meaning makers, and one of the main means that we have for making meaning, <laughs> I think, is story. Not the only means, but a key means. Um, by means of what has been called narrative intelligence, narrative thought, Jerome Bruner's term, again, narrative competence, autobiographical reasoning, it's an area that I've become particularly interested in, uh, particularly from uh, a group of psychologists uh, who have come out of Northwestern University and have been influenced by the thinking of narrative psychologist Dan McAdams, about whom I'll say more shortly. Some more quotations. This is from Alex Haley, the author of the book Roots. Every time an old person dies, it's like a library burns down. I often start workshops or classes in my gerontology field with this quotation, and oftentimes, ah, oh, the response is yes, makes so much sense. Here's another quotation that I find helpful, provocative. Every person is born into life as a blank page. Every person leaves life as a full book. I'm not so sure about the blank page bit, because I think we come into this world trailing the stories of our parents and their parents before them and our communities and cultures and creeds and so forth. So narrative gerontology. I'm not going to go on specifically too much about narrative gerontology because we're in an education context, but I need to give, need to give you a bit of a sense as to why I find narrative a very helpful approach in the study of aging. Gerontology is a multidisciplinary field, as some of you I'm sure know. Uh, so we have subfields like uh, social gerontology, educational gerontology, biogerontology, psychogerontology. So a number of us some years ago said, well, what the heck, let's throw in narrative gerontology. And what is the starting point for narrative gerontology? For me, it's a very basic homespun kind of starting point, and that is the importance and the appeal that stories obviously have for many older adults, and perhaps for all of us as we age. And by the way, we're all aging, whether we're 20 or 200. Um, so that's a key starting point for me. Um, the idea also that older adults can be, have been, and in some contexts are story keepers and are revered and respected as elders. Certainly we have this tradition within our First Nations community. Uh, one psychologist, and by the way, you're getting some random points here, not in any particular order. One psychologist has referred to later life as the narrative phase par excellence. And I like to add to that that the developmental task, you're familiar with uh, your understanding of psychology with the concept of developmental tasks. When we're two years of age, the developmental tasks are such things as learning how to walk and talk and so on and so forth. Well, there are developmental tasks at every stage, and in later life, there is no exception. And some of those, I'll get to them later, some of those developmental tasks, I think, could be, could be referred to as narrative tasks. The task of making meaning of the life that we have lived, and preparing ourselves for the life that we will continue to live. Uh, one biogerontologist whose work I really appreciate, actually, I, can, I appreciate because I can understand it. <laughs> he writes very accessibly, Gene Cohen. 
uh, he talks about how there are changes in our aging brains themselves that facilitate uh, uh, this narrative dimension of the aging process. Uh, the capacity that we have for improved regulation of our emotions, uh, better cooperation between left brain and right brain functions, a capacity for what's been referred to as post-formal thinking, picking up on Piaget's work, the, cap the capacity to understand, to identify with, uh, and be tolerant of paradox and contradiction and metaphor and symbol. Um, so Cohen talks about the urge that increases within us for autobiographical expression or the inner drive to engage in some type of summing up. I think Eric Erickson started the ball rolling in this regard by saying that his chapter, or sorry, his stage eight of psychosocial development, ego integrity versus despair, it, our, our, our movement through that stage is assisted by our involvement in some process of life review, which is nothing if not a narrative kind of task. So some more on narrative gerontology itself draws upon a variety of disciplines, narrative psychology, narrative therapy, narrative sociology. But for me, the key thing as a gerontologist is that as a narrativist, I'm more interested in the biographical aspects of or complexity of aging than in the biological. Now, the biological and the biographical are intertwined. Psyche and soma, uh, you know, affect each other, of course. But there has been as comparatively little uh, attention paid within my discipline to what could be called the inside, the rich, intriguing inside of the aging process. When it comes to the study of memory and aging, for example, very often if you read psycho, um, gerontological journals, the focus is on how you know, sensory memory or working memory uh, it declines in efficacy by such and such a percentage and so forth. I think of that as talking about the mechanics of memory and how that's affected by aging, which is all well and good to know about. But what about the meanings that our memories have for us? So it's this emphasis on meaning and meaning making that keeps coming up again for us as narrative gerontologists. However, there is, and I think we could all uh, attest to this, there is lurking in our society at large uh, what's been called a narrative of decline. Aging in general is viewed as a downer, as a slide down towards disease, disability, dependence, and death, okay? That's not, in my view, the whole story. And so a narrative gerontology perspective, in my view, opens up uh, some conceptual uh, space to look at and to celebrate the positive sides of the aging process, growth in meaning, in creativity, in wisdom, growth period. And I like to throw out the idea that the key to growing old, and not simply getting old, if you catch my distinction, is cultivating what I crudely call a good, strong story. We're doing a study at St. Thomas in our narrative center, CERN, on the logo down on the lower right. We're doing a study of the link between older adults' level of resilience before the, the uh, challenges of later life, as measured by a resilience scale, and the complexity and the thickness of the stories that they tell about their lives. And overall, I mean, it's a complex uh, sort of things we're finding, but overall, I think the pattern is true that the more rich, thick, layered, expanded, extended story that people have about their lives tends to equate with high scores on resilience. So that's an area that we're working on. We haven't yet won the Nobel Prize, but I think it's probably just around the corner. <laughs> so now that we just shift from gerontology to psychology proper, which, as I say, is a field that I feel, the field that I feel has done so much to highlight the narrative complexity of human life. Here's a quotation from Dan McCann, who I mentioned him before. Identity, he says, and he's picking up on Erickson's concept of identity. Identity is a life story, which he defines as an internalized and evolving narrative. In some places, he calls it a personal myth that provides our life with a sense of unity, meaning, and purpose. So identity for McAdams is what we call the story of my life. And then there's Gustave Flaubert, another French writer. Everyone's life, he says, is worth a novel. Well, probably he would say that. He's a novelist. Spent a lot of time in cafes and bistros. 
people watching saw some character go by, shuffling along in an interesting way, made up a story, put that character into a novel, and there he goes. So narrative identity, complex concept. Um, but basically, for me, it boils down to this. If you ask me to tell you about myself, I'm probably not going to say, well, I'm five foot six point two, or I'm getting you know lower as you get more down to earth as you age, and I weigh so many pounds, and my uh, toenails grow at such and such a rate. I'm not going to give you stats and facts. I'm going to say, well, I was born at a very young age, and I grew up in Harvey Station. Don't hold that against me. And we have another Harvey Station person, and a sort of a Harvey Station person. Uh, I'm going to tell you some sort of miniature version of the story of my life, depending upon how much I think you can, you can bear, how much you're interested in, okay? Um, and I've got a point here, this, this phrase, composing a life. Some of you will recall this phrase from the work of Mary Catherine Bateson, an anthropologist, educator, feminist, a uh, bit of everything, really. We had her actually as one of our, our very first keynote speaker at the Narrative Matters Conference in 2002. Some of you may have attended or heard about that. Uh, from, from her perspective, and this is the title of one of her key books, Composing Life. Composing Life is a creative, what I would call narrative, textual, quasi-literary process. Okay? We're constantly working on reworking the story of our lives, the story by which we understand who we are and explain ourselves to others. Going along with that, for me, is the, is the notion that autobiographical memories, which we know are very, play a very central role in our sense of who we are, in our sense of identity, they are hardly anything uh, like the exact sort of replicas or reproductions of actual events. Our memories are more often uh, com strange combinations of fact and fictionalization that I like to call faction. So memory is a matter of faction, if you want to take that home with you. There's, there's interpretation, there's embellishment, there's editing things and editing things out and so forth that go, goes into the formation of these memories that are central to often to who and what we understand ourselves to be. So the self story that we are is, is not a, ever, it's never a finished project. It's always ongoing. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that, um, and this is an odd sort of way of thinking about things, and it's taking the metaphor of life as story to a kind of a peculiar point. But I like to think of the self is at one and the same time the author, the narrator, the character, the editor, and the reader of the story by which it understands itself. Okay. And all of that's happening, we're composing from within. Okay. So if you think of your own life, you are, I'm suggesting, in the midst of your own, you're simultaneously author, or co-author perhaps, um, narrator, character, editor, reader, critic, <laughs> all at once of your own unfolding story. Uh, picking up on Gustave Flaubert's concept of everyone's life is worth a novel. I like to talk about the novelty of our lives. I like to play with words, and uh, sometimes that can get you in trouble. Sometimes it can open up fresh <laughs> insights. So our lives are unique. There is, there is, and has never been uh, another John McLaughlin, a Bill Randall, a Hillary Drain. Uh, we are all unique. That's in that sense novel. Our lives are storied, and complex, and layered, and a point that we can debate. We're many stories in one. When you read a novel, you're reading different chapters, and different, each chapter has different scenes, and there are subplots, so there are many stories that make up the one story that is the, the novel that we're enjoying. And once you start to play with this metaphor of life as story, life as a novel, then it's, it's, it becomes easy to start inviting people to think of the chapters, and the themes, and the subplots, and the characters in their stories. It, when I teach a course called Narrative Gerontology and I invite students to, you know, take some time to sort of think of your life as a story, and what, are the ch what have been so far the chapters in your story? They quickly start writing, it's just it's sort of easy peasy. That, that metaphor is, is an inviting and disarming kind of metaphor. So selves as novelists, lives as novels, it opens up the door for us to have some very interesting explorations about the, the, liter the, the link between life and literature. So if any of you have a, a literature background, literary theory, English background, 
we need the insights from your area to help us better appreciate the complexity and the mystery of the self-making process. Lives as texts. Um, how are we doing for time, Jose? We're doing pretty good. Uh, so how much more time oh, do I have? I <laughs> um, well, we should end by eight, but but um, but usually there's time for questions. Sure. So and, and we want to fit 7 in. 7.30. 7.30 now? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Good. Um, so still on the concept of narrative identity, I'm, I'm interested in this. For me, at least, this is, I, you're getting my quirky Bill Randall version of narrative generally and narrative gerontology in particular. Okay, this is not the whole story. There's a ton of narrativists out there uh, in each of the different disciplines I've alluded to. And the discussion is so exciting. I'm just one voice in the discussion. Uh, that we are many stories and we are one story. Some days we feel like we're getting it together. And other days it does seem like we are made up of bits and pieces of, of episodes and events and we're not sure if they do hang together. There's an interesting quotation from an autobiography scholar. And by the way, the, the field of autobiography and autobiographical theory and criticism is extremely interesting and important to bring into the discussion of narrative psychology. But Paul John Eakin uh, says in one place, there are many stories of self to tell and many selves to tell them. I don't know if any of you have embarked upon the task of writing your life story. Maybe you don't feel that you're ready to do that or you want to do that. Um, I've done some autobiographical kinds of things, and it's quickly you realize, even in just trying to tell one particular event from your own life, how do I tell this? From what vantage point? Which self do I want to sort of sit in to relate this particular story? Because any story in my own life can be told from so many different perspectives, by so many different selves that are in me. Uh, so when you think of the library of your life, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the library. There's, uh, there's data, there's information, there are telephone books, there's cookbooks, and so forth. But there's a lot of narrative material. There are short stories, there are long stories. There's a story about what you did last evening with your friend, and then there's the long story about the first marriage. Don't get me started, sort of thing, okay? There are stories that we have that are sort of general, sort of thing, like the kind of things we used to do. When I was a kid, I loved to go sliding on my toboggan, but there was that one specific time that I slid down the hill and rammed right into a barbed wire fence behind uh, uh, Kelly's barn, okay? So you get the general stories, you get the specific ones. Solo stories, stories that concern just ourselves, and stories that concern the people who are part of our lives, children, family, spouses, etc. Past stories, we have stories about our past, but we also have storylines about our future, about what we're gonna do when we get home this evening, about what we're gonna do over the holidays, about what we're gonna do when we retire, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are stories that we have told and can tell, and we all have stories that we don't know how to tell, that are perhaps untellable until we find the right words, the right audience, and maybe never will. And in psychology, narrative psychology, there's a, there's a friendly debate going on between the big story advocates and the small story advocates. Big story, a big story approach refers to uh, the, the, the broad sort of narrative activity that we engage in, we're trying to get a sense of our life as a whole. But in fact, on an everyday basis, we're constantly involved in conversations with partners and friends in creating and recreating small stories about particular events. And some of those small stories end up being part of our bigger story. Um, I'm interested, particularly working with older adults, in the role of self-defining memory what have been called nuclear episode or set pieces or what I and my colleague Gary Kenyon call signature stories. I think we all have a collection. Alex might remember this from the time he took, took the narrative gerontology class. I think we all have inside of us a collection of favorite stories uh, that we have heard ourselves trot out to friends, strangers, family members, whatever, about the time we did such and such or the one time blah, blah. These are stories that maybe we've told so often uh, in so many circumstances that, 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 that they're kind of central to who we see ourselves, or they're central to how we want ourselves to be perceived by others, put it that way. Um, so I'm interested in what, when, I, when I'm working with older adults, oftentimes I'm hearing stories that I'm sure they've 
told a lot of other people. My dad, for example, who's older than I am, and now living in an assisted living context, uh, he wrote his autobiography a few years ago, or his memoir, Showers of Blessing, memoir of a preacher, teacher, and singer, okay? Uh, he's very proud to write that uh, life story and have it in print. Now that he's in Windsor Court, on the other side of the river, he has this one uh, home support person who comes to see him every afternoon for a half hour of restorative care. And one in particular delights him because she takes his book off the shelf and reads to him from his own life story. And she read one particular story just the other day. He was so excited to tell me about this. He read it, she read a particular story to him that he's very, very proud of. Okay? Because it's a story that reminds him of some basic values that he has. So for her to read the story brought tears to her eyes, and it brought tears to his eyes to see that it was bringing tears to her eyes, if that makes any sense. Okay, I, I just I love those kinds of uh, uh, anecdotes, shall we say, that prove, prove to me the power of story. Many of our autobiographical memories, however, I think, are anomalies. We don't remember all the times we went sliding in, in detail, but we remember the one time that something went wrong. Okay, and I think if you look at many of your signature stories, they, they they're often about things where uh, where where things went wrong, where the rules didn't apply, uh, there was a surprise or a discovery or whatever. And it's interesting that it's upon many of those stories that we form our sense of self. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm not sure what to do with it. And finally. I think we all live inside of our own unique story world. You know, we, we, maybe you've been said, oh, you've been told by somebody, oh, you, you live in your own little world. Well, from a narrative perspective, we all do live in our own unique story world. There's overlap and interaction between our story worlds and the others that, we're, uh, that we live our lives with. But. So more quotations as we shift to the concept of narrative development. We are like stories that are unfolding according to our own inner theme and plot, written by William Bridges, who was an English professor, and then he converted to psychotherapy and became a therapist, and wrote a wonderful little book back in 1971 called Transitions. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff in that book. And he really draws upon the story metaphor. And then Donald Polkinghorne, whose masterful book, Narrative Knowing in the Human Sciences, uh, is a must read for anybody exploring uh, the terrain of narrative psychology. He says in his book, we are in the middle of our stories and cannot be sure how they will end. We're constantly having to revise the plot as new events are added to our lives. I really like that concept. So let's say a little bit then about narrative development. Obviously, lives of stories are not static entities, but are developing and changing. They're fluid, dynamic. How are they developing? Well, as the expression goes, the plot thickens. As we get older and there's more people in our lives or there are more involvements that we have, on some level, the plot thickens. Now maybe as we get very old, it starts to narrow in again, okay? Like any novel does that as you reach the end. Uh, controversially, Dan McAdams has proposed that the development of our, our narrative development, ideally, he says, proceeds in the direction of what he calls, controversially, good life story form. I'm just going to put these out here. I'm not going to explain each one because that would take us to another whole uh, lecture. But he, he's identified coherence. The story that we tell ourselves and others about ourselves should ideally hang together, should cohere in some way. It should relate to the facts, should be credible. All right? uh, there was an election recently somewhere south of the border, and I think some of us became quite aware that uh, some of the stories we heard from some of the candidates Lacked credibility, it seemed. But I don't want to go there. I don't want to say more about that. <laughs> Openness, reconciliation, generative integration, some other qualities, McAdams would say, about a so called good life story. Now, those of you who are working in the field of counseling may be able to make some connections here, insofar as in the counseling context, there's a sense, I think you could say, in which uh, the client tells a story about his or her life. And the clinician attempts to help the client rework that story, go into that story, rethink the story, get a different version of the story. So there's a narrative process going on, ideally towards a more functional story by which the client can live and move forward. Uh, Dan McAdams 
I'm sorry if I'm leaning a lot on him, but he does. He has, he has been quite helpful in laying out some concepts. He talks about the stages, and I know we can be skeptical about stages, stage theory, etc. But he says the three broad stages of narrative of the development of our narrative identity are what he calls the pre-mythic, the mythic, the post-mythic. And the pre-mythic, when we're little kids, we are, he says, gathering material. Incidents happen in our lives, and before we know it, they become part of who we understand ourselves to be. They become central to our story. In the mythic stage, we move more consciously into putting together that story that we'll understand ourselves in terms of. Adolescence would be the key thing. When the adolescent, the teenager, pulls back from mom and dad, siblings, chums, who am I? What's my story, as opposed to their story of me? And with that, that mythic, that building of the story, expanding the story, he says, goes on all throughout our adult life. And as we move into later life, he would suggest, we kind of say, we get into the post-mythic phase, where we're kind of looking back more than we're looking ahead, and reflecting upon the story by which we have lived thus far. Um, so later life uh, is a time when identity work and story work still continues. Even for my 97-year-old dad, there's restoring going on. Uh, oh, that's not in your handout. I was thinking of uh, Oliver, Wonder, Oliver Wendell Holmes and the Chambered Nautilus. Okay? And I guess I threw that in there because on some level, as we grow, you could argue that we're, we're outgrowing certain storylines about ourselves and putting in place, in a very subtle sort of process, putting in place sort of larger stories by which to understand who we are and what our world is. Uh, then at the end, the story opens up and <laughs> the next stage, perhaps. Um, that's a theological issue, I suppose. But anyway, who's this guy? It's me. And uh, I was probably about five or six years of age, and I was standing in front of Knowlton's store in the downtown core of Harvey Station, across from the phone booth, which is no longer there. There are no phone booths anywhere, are there? What do you think I'm thinking? <laughs> What's going on there? I think I had a pee. <laughs> uh, or I was mad or I was being funny or trying to be funny. I'm not sure what was going on because I can't remember that day. So my question now is, who was that little guy? What sort of story did he have about his life you know, at that time? And how has the story that he had about his life at that time changed over the years? Because it definitely has. Here's Jerome Bruner, who, I, who just passed away here about uh, three or four months ago at the age of 100. I heard him speak. Uh, a keynote, gave a keynote speech at the Narratives Matters Conference in Paris in 2014. And he was still on all firing on all uh, uh, eight cylinders for sure. He says in his groundbreaking little article, Life as Narrative, 1987, a life as lived is inseparable from a life as told. The ways of telling and the ways of conceptualizing that go with them become so habitual that they finally become recipes for structuring experience itself for laying down roots to memory, for not only guiding the life narrative up to the present, but directing it into the future. I think you could have a whole seminar just on that one quotation, plus this follow-up from the same article. In the end, here he's thinking gerontologically, we become the autobiographical narratives by which we tell about our lives. And that concept, although I hadn't read this quotation at the time, was central to my, my book, The Stories We Are, which I've got a copy of over there. It's not that we are our story, and we don't just have story. And he says, I cannot imagine a more important psychological research project than one that addresses itself to the development of autobiography, how our way of telling about ourselves changes, and how these accounts come to take control of our ways of life. So it's not like we have a story so much as our story has us, which is a central insight, I think you could say, in what's called narrative therapy where the therapist works with the client to restory, to come up with a story that enables the client to live more fully, uh, more less problem-saturatedly, and so forth. I know that there are narrative therapy experts here in our midst. Um, so a few more things about narrative therapy, sorry, narrative development. Paradox is that we develop 
narratively in a retrospective way. There's stuff that happens to us in life. But in some respect, it's not until we can pause and reflect on that stuff and make some sense of it that we're able to kind of move forward. This is why we have holidays, where hopefully we have a half an hour or half a day or half a week to kind of catch up with ourselves. In that respect, I think you could say that our story is always on some level, some level lagging behind our life, per se. Much of our lived experience, so uh, narrative therapists have argued, much of our lived experience goes unstoried. And I would also add unread or underread, which is the uh, insight that kind of fueled my colleague Beth McKim and I to write a book called Reading Our Lives, The Poetics of Growing Old, and that's over there as well. Uh, so again, the, the, the developmental tasks of aging I think are narrative tasks involving life review, making meaning, remembering, autobiographical learning. The neat thing, though, is that there's no limit to our narrative development. There is a limit to our biological, physical, physical development. Like 120 years seems to be the max. Okay? Not too many human beings get to live beyond that. But narratively or biographically, there is no built-in limit. In the same way that when you read and savor a great novel, there's no limit to how much meaning you can make from it. If you belong to a, a book club and you have different perspectives on that same book, you can go on talking forever, getting all kinds of neat things out of that one text. Gender differences in narrative development, that is a topic that is huge. And I'm going to jump over it. Perhaps we can go back to it in question time. But there's been some fascinating research done by colleagues such as uh, Robin Fivish down at uh, University, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, on the, the, the gender differences in the way little girls are socialized by their moms or dads to talk about the events in their little lives. Mm -hmm. And they're more likely to be coached to, to talk about going to the zoo last week with more emotional nuance, more details. Little boys more likely to be coached to stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's some truth to that trend, it seems to me that it's no surprise that when you get to be 65 or so, maybe women have more complex inner worlds, more layered stories than men do, and therefore maybe more inner resources, which might be a factor in why women live longer than men. I'm just going to throw that out there as a neat possibility. Uh, narrative environment. How are we doing for time, Jose? I'm paranoid about time. Right. Uh, yeah, we've got 12 more minutes. Well, all right. Uh, okay. I'm really interested in the concept of narrative environment. So a couple of quotes to lead into that. To become a couple is to agree implicitly to live in terms of another person's story. Although, he adds, it sometimes takes a while to get the part down really well. <laughs> and then Roger Shank, who interestingly enough is an uh, artificial intelligence expert slash psychologist, wrote a book called Tell Me a Story, in which he says that if we're going to train computers to think like humans do, we've got to train them to tell and understand stories. Uh, he says, the stories of our culture are those that we hear so often that they cease to seem like stories to us. They are the stories that we take for granted, stories we live by. So I like to point out that, that our narrative development does not take place in a vacuum, but rather we live and we story our lives within a complex web of larger stories that are themselves constantly changing. And each of those larger stories or systems from family to religion has its own unique narrative environment. I have a little story to tell, and that is that when I was, I don't know, 12 or so, older than the guy in the picture, <coughs> um, I grew up in a, the minister's household. And there's a very definite narrative environment in a minister's household when you're at the meal time, at, at dinner time. Okay? You don't talk about certain things. You don't use certain words. You don't tell certain jokes that you might think are terribly funny, okay? And your dad has more airtime because he is, after all, the minister in the community. So there was a certain stifling quality to the narrative environment in the Randall family household. When I went to visit my friend Allie Wood, Allison Wood, you would know him, Nora, uh, who lived out on the Tweetside Road near Oromocto Lake, well, it was a very different narrative environment around the table. Okay, it's like I could say anything I wanted to, and they would laugh and think that was very funny. Now, maybe they were just on best behavior because I was the minister's kid. I'm not sure. 
but uh, there was a different feel. And there was a different sort of implicit and in code of conduct narratively as to who could say what to who, in what ways, uh, and so forth. Very different narrative environment. One, I think I could say, kind of life stifling. <laughs> I really wanted to be in Ellie Wood's family, but they wouldn't adopt me. There were legal issues for some reason. I think I would have grown up a very different, maybe nicer person if I had grown up in the Wood family. That's who knows about that. Um, so, and our, the narrative environments in which and through which we live and move and have our being, they can be micro from our particular families, the marriages that we're involved. Think of a marriage or an intimate partnership as a narrative environment, okay? Friendships, the communities we live in, Harvey, as opposed to McAdam. Institutions, St. Thomas University, as opposed to UNB. I think there's different, overall, in some way, different type of narrative. So students tell me, for better or for worse. Um, and then the macro uh, in narrative environments, or you could call them meta-narratives of our countries, of our cultures, our religions, uh, our gender. Etc. Here I think of the election and how we saw week after week, debate after debate, two very different narratives about America being trotted out, and we were, you know, we were being urged to believe in one as opposed to the other. Well, we saw how that worked out, and a lot of the concern nowadays is we have a different story. We don't know. Uh, the, the old story that we thought we had about who we are as a country is not the story that we have voted in, okay? for better or for worse. Maybe better, who knows? Uh, so these grand overarching narratives have a profound impact, as do the micro narrative environments, on how we story our lives. And that's a fascinating topic where psychology meets sociology and anthropology, etc., as well as theology. Oh, here's my narrative environment. Uh, my family, at least. Uh, there's Dad, uh, obviously, me up there, and my sister Carol, who is the storyteller in our family. She's the one who's currently working on her autobiography, and uh, she's up to chapter three. It's going to be a chapter twelve kind of autobiography. She's, she's a detail person. She's putting in every detail she can possibly uh, find, and it's going to be a fantastic story. But she's had a very courageous life. Um, sorry, I should have shown you that. So obviously, creeds, spiritual traditions, can be looked at as meta-narratives that provide us with uh, uh, structures of meaning, uh, ways of interpreting our experience, making sense of ourselves and our place in our families and in the cosmos. Okay? Uh, I have a dear friend who's, uh, who's a Muslim, and we have fascinating conversations on this very point. And he's very curious about the Christian master story. Christian there, and uh, just came from having a chat with it before I arrived here, as a matter of fact. Um, so that brings me, though, to an interesting quotation from Salman Rushdie. Those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless because they cannot think new thoughts. So it's a sobering kind of cautionary comment about the impact and the power of the larger stories that we subscribe to, adhere to, or are uh, attracted to, or tempted to. Tempted by. Um, we're running out of time. I want to talk a little bit about narrative challenges, um, starting which with the bottom one here. The concept of narrative foreclosure has been coined by a colleague, Mark Freeman, a psychologist at Holy Cross in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Narrative foreclosure, he says, is the premature conviction that the story of one's life has effectively ended, that the future is a foregone conclusion, that no new chapters, adventures, or themes are apt to open up. Now, you can be narratively foreclosed when you're a teenager, 14 or 15, and your boyfriend or girlfriend says, sayonara. Okay? And as far as you're concerned, it's the end of the world. Why must the world go on turning? Why must these eyes of mine? You know how that song goes, okay? And until somebody says, oh, look, there's more fish in the sea. Come on, you'll get over it. You know, there's a lot more future ahead of you. But when you're 70, narrative foreclosure, I think, can be more of a possibility, okay? And that's where my 
my goal as a narrative gerontologist is to find ways and encourage people to find ways to keep their stories open. So some of the challenges besides narrative foreclosure are narrative loneliness, narrative loss. Unfortunately, many nursing homes in our country, although they have wonderful uh, you know, designs and so forth, are from a narrative envir environment perspective rather bleak, or rather thin. And because of that, the individuals who are residents there, uh, their stories shrivel up, atrophy. Um, and they're surrounded by very few people who know their stories from before. And I think that's a, a great loss. But it can be addressed through narrative care, narrative dispossession. People who can't tell their stories in ways that we think are normal, for example, people with dementia, we tend to dispossess them of their stories because they assume, we assume because they can't tell a story that maybe there's no story there, and therefore no person, no identity. I'm putting it radically. My colleague Clive Baldwin has written quite persuasively about the, 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 the danger of narratively dispossessing uh, people in certain populations. Narrative imprisonment. I uh, like this guy here. Um, what do you want to say to this guy here from a narrative perspective? What's his dilemma? Turn your head. Turn your head. Yeah, <laughs> let it go. Drop it. But it's like, you know, he's saying, that's my story and I'm stuck to it. Um, now, I, this is, you can use that in a counseling class to invite some discussion, I think, among students. What you do, you know, in, in a situation with a client like this is holding on to a particular version of him or herself with all the problems that that version entails, and you are sitting there, there's another way to story your life. Um, so we're coming to the close of what I want to say to you tonight. Could go on at a great length about narrative care. Um, I like this concept that listeners shape what tellers tell. It's all about the listening. I like to think that every one of us here in this room has had the good fortune to have a good okay. listener at some stage. You've got something that you're working on, that you're troubled by, that you're wrestling with. You go to somebody who's been well trained by Jose and colleagues here, and they know how to listen. And you come out of the session feeling not so much like the problem has been solved, but you feel stronger in terms of who you are. You feel stronger in your own story, which is the bottom line here, telling our stories in ways that make us stronger. That's actually the title of a book by a couple of narrative therapists uh, from Down Under who work with Aboriginal populations, telling our stories in ways that make us stronger. So narrative care, uh, that's a topic we can get into during the Q&A if you wish to. Um, it's probably one of the areas that I am personally most interested in as I go forward as a narrative gerontologist. How can we take narrative care to the streets I'm very excited that in our own Fredericton area, we've got a lot of life story activities bubbling up all over the place. There's a woman named Vivian Edwards, who used to teach here at UNB, uh, who's now retired. And uh, she uh, attended a workshop that I gave on this sort of thing. And she came to me later and said, I'd like to start a, a, a life writing group. What do you think? I said, go for it. So they've been meeting now at Shannex. They have a room at Shannex. People from the community, not necessarily Shannex residents, but a meeting from from the community, about 30 or 40 of them, every month, writing their stories. Not the whole story of the life, but specific stories. And then certain people read those stories to the rest of the group. And what that, what that typically uh, engenders is great curiosity on the part of the other. Oh, I'm going to go home and write this story about my life. And so they're starting to get excited about their own stories. And I think the spin-off in terms of self-esteem and in terms of self-discovery is incredible to contemplate. And it's sort of what I call therapeutic. It's not therapy per se. In fact, they're adamant. This is not therapy, but it feels good. And we feel better about ourselves. Uh, so, yeah, narrative care is it's not rocket science, I guess. And narrative care is a blanket term that can be used to, to refer to a lots of different sort of interventions, from the formal to the informal. Um, so ongoing things that I'm interested in. As I say, narrative care itself, how can we how can we help how can we train people working in the healthcare field, from home support workers to nurses to nurses' aides to doctors, 
to physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers, the whole gamut, to have a sensitivity to the narrative richness and complexity of the, their, the lives of the people they're dealing with. Which also, I think, means having a, a, a appreciation for the narrative complexity of your own life, which is why I like to say that narrative care begins at home. How can we be, how can we offer ourselves as agents of uh, restoring uh, to other people if we're oblivious to the complexity and the richness and the mystery in our own stories? Um, narrative care in classrooms. Uh, I know there is work being done in this area. I'm sure it's probably some of it being done here, but. I, I think that's an important area to, to pursue because you develop connections with students. You learn about their stories and they learn a little bit about yours. And hopefully we are agents in a positive way as they rework uh, their sense of who they are in the world, their story. The whole the difference between telling stories versus writing stories, oral history versus written uh, autobiography, narrative literacy and the helping professions, I think I've touched upon that. And as I say, narrative and resilience. I think I have the sense that if we could help people cultivate stronger, thicker, richer stories about their lives and uh, in the world, that that will have a positive impact upon mental and emotional health. I'm a bit naive in my thinking on this, but I, I have this gut sense. So these are some books that uh, are out there, some, some, uh, just a few. I mean, the world of narrative studies is growing in the crazy. Uh, mushroom kind of, we have a journal, you may have heard of it, called Narrative Works. It comes out of St. Thomas University. If you are interested in uh, having your work considered for publication, uh, we would be welcome. Uh, we would welcome that. Uh, you can reach us through our CERN website, Narrative Works, under the CERN website. So, I'll end there. Well, we do have time for questions um, and then here and then we also have uh, coffee snacks second floor room 242? the lounge, yeah, the lounge. The lounge. But, but, uh, 242 I think it is um, if you want to meet more informally to engage in more story and engaging with each other talking about our own stories all right but are there questions go ahead uh, I've got three. Maybe um, <laughs> Matt should have gone for this. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm, uh, thanks a lot for that. I really appreciate the thanks, very informative presentation, too. And uh, made me think of a couple things. While, and that photo you put up of the person holding yeah. the, um, uh, the prison cell image made me think of this a little bit, too. Um, we can put it up while we're talking. Yeah. So I'm just wondering about uh, story environment in this situation. Yeah. Story environment in. Um, encouraging this to be very solid. That, that's all I like. The story environment, those macro stories that we don't really have control on, what mm -hmm. kind of work is done in narrative at potentially shifting those narratives rather than asking this person to shift their narrative. Sure. That's sort of yeah, we have limited control of shifting the big narratives. I think when, when many of us woke up last Wednesday morning, mm -hmm. we realized that the ground had shifted somewhat. Mm -hmm. I, for one, felt there's nothing I could have done about it. I'm not well, the they should be the narrative. And everybody has to live with that new narrative, or maybe it's an old narrative in new form. So nothing much we can do about those. But the narrative environments uh, that we are part of every day of life, I think we do have more agency, you know, in our friendships, in our connections with one another in normal sorts of uh, interactions. Uh, uh, there's ways to be, always to be better listeners uh, and to, uh, to um, there's a concept that Gary Kenyon and I have uh, played around with, and that's wisdom environment. A wisdom environment, and I know it's a kind of a hokey sounding term maybe, but a wisdom environment is a, is, a, is a type of narrative environment where we we feel uh, safe in exploring our stories, talking about our lives, making sense of things, trying out alternative versions, and we're listened to in a respectful, open, non-judging kind of way. And I mean, some of us have probably tasted wisdom environments in church groups, maybe, or in uh, in uh, support groups, or all kinds of contexts. So those those more micro narrative environments, I think we do have more control over. We also, though, have control, maybe, of how we react to the big stories that are swirling around out there in our world. Yes, we can't deliberately or explicitly change them, but we can explain. We can we can maybe change how we 
make sense of them or how we relate to them. I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but yeah. And of course, yeah. all right, this is not much of an answer maybe, no, but. No, no, uh, just wanted yeah. to hear you speak to it. Okay. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation, first of all. Uh, but maybe I'll ask the three in a row and you can answer whichever one you want. <laughs> um, so the first one's just a little abstract. Do you think narrative precedes all encounters with human meaning? Like, we can't make sense of anything. We need narrative first. So that even if you like roll the ball across the front of the room, I cannot apprehend what that means except through narrative. Is it that foundational? I think it is. And there are others that can argue that much better than I can. That are that are that our basic way of perceiving things, whether it's a ball rolling or a bunch of stick figures in a sequence of uh, cartoon, is a, is that we, we 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 impose a narrative structure of one sort or other, whether we but without even thinking about it. So I think that at the, at the, and this is the, there, are, there are those who are working in the area of cognitive neuroscience from a narrative perspective, trying to make that point that yeah, that the, the narrativity is hardwired into our, our our way of perceiving. I found myself trying to think about as you were talking if there's any information I can perceive where narrative doesn't come first, and I, I find that very difficult to do. Uh, well, there there are schools of thought on both sides of this, of this uh, how how basic is narrative, okay? And there there are some would say, well, no, no, not everything is narrative. Not everything that we perceive is in narrative uh, ways and so forth. But uh, I'm kind of stuck on that notion myself. I mean, the farthest I can go is maybe the world doesn't necessarily exist in narrative, but my only way to access it is through narrative. Yes, right. and your only way to make sense of the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so there's schools of thought on it. Yeah. The second thing is just... And I, we can talk later about uh, sources that, that may go into that issue in, in greater depth. Oh, sure. yeah. And then the second thing, when you talk about multiple selves in terms of autobiographical narrative, how do you think we as educators um, should try to understand these people like Piaget and Eric Erickson who are so foundational to how we built these educational systems their models strike me as very linear yeah. and didactic even. And here we're thinking about all these ways in which narratives are messy. Yeah, narratives are messy. And then yet we have this whole system based on a particular view of the of life course narrative. Yeah. yeah. And, and stages and I so mean, uh, would you be critical of that? I'm becoming more critical of it, yeah. I mean I have found uh, you know Erickson, for example, to be helpful only because Dan McAdams says he's helpful. <laughs> and I may be leaning too much on Dan McAdams, but Dan McAdams, who is, comes out of a personality uh, developmental uh, perspective as a psychologist, picks up on Erickson's notion of identity and says, identity is this evolving, internalized life story, uh, which is messy and dynamic and not fixed in any way. So. Um, but to, 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 to critique in some profound way these established uh, theoretical perspectives, uh, that's, that's an important work that probably needs to be done. I, I don't have the capacity, mental capacity, to do that. So, yeah. right, and then the last one, and this is my sort of exposure to some of this literature comes from online life or thinking about how young people yep. interact online. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering wh where the field is on that in terms of the, the fact that we live a lot of our lives online yep. and the rupturing of a lot of these ideas about uh, about uh, linear narratives and so on. Yep. And my own little thought is that these ruptures are maybe actually, they're just giving social articulation to what really matches the interior process of how we narrativize, that we move back and forth and talk, constantly yep. restoring. Yep. Um, but is, is the field... Yes, part of the field of narrative psychology, I mentioned it earlier, the small stories mm -hmm. folks. I, I think I've always been a kind of a big story person, but I'm really, really being drawn more to, to what the small story psychologists are telling us about the importance of and the dynamic quality of those everyday interactions, whether they're face-to-face -face or online. And there's a couple of people whose names come immediately to mind who are working in this area and have written uh, some very intriguing stuff. One is an Alexandria. I may have the first name wrong, but her last name is Georgia Coppolu. Um, I was going to copy that down, but uh, yeah, good luck with that. Georgia, <laughs> as in Georgia, uh, and then it's a Greek 
last name. Um, but George Akopoulou, Michael Bamberg, the, and Michael Bamberg is the editor of the journal Narrative Inquiry, and he is, he's very much an advocate of the small stories uh, approach to, to narrative studies and the importance of these, of how identity, for example, among teenagers, when they have you know, constant sort of back and forth with conversations about you know, what they did at the party the day before and so forth, that story work that's going on there, which is all over the place, messy for sure, but absolutely essential, potentially, to the, to the, to the development of a, of a larger narrative by which the individual understands him or herself. But I'm, that's not an area that I'm up on, but it's definitely a, a, a hot topic. So thanks for identifying that. Yes. Okay, I'll go. Um, I'm kind of, I, was, um, I was struck by your language. Uh, um, the title of your talk was looking at adult development. And let me put myself straight up there, but I'm an adult educator okay. uh, who studies transitions and development. Yes. And so I was really interested in the language um, around storying and the fact that it's very stuck in the psychology. Okay. And I was thinking about the ways in which we try to think about development in, in terms of adults is, and the ways in which we reflect on the same old sort of hegemonic ideologies that, in, that permeate our stories. Mm -hmm. and, th and how do we get to that critical understanding of self? Uh, and that, uh, that was one of the things that was, that's one, yep. one thought that was sort of entering in and that, and that in some ways we story our lives in not, sometimes not truthful ways to save to face, yes. To, yeah, to change the story. I, I, I think it starts young. When I listen to my five-year-old retell stories in different ways. Yeah. Um, and I'm always sort of, I was interested in the fact that, that you used in your title the notion of adult development, which to me has a particular literature, and we ended up somewhere else around storying in there. Yeah. But, but, but again, that how do, we, how do we reflect on our own narratives is sort of what I would get to with that discussion. How do we ever reflect upon our own narratives? Right, because um, I think that we tend to tell the same hegemonic story. So my students do a lot of storying in my classes. Okay. They, they, they do autobiographies with the idea that if you to look at their relationship, for example, to cultural diversity, or look at their relationship to learning, mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the aim to look critically at the way they story themselves. Yep, that's excellent. Because I think the more critically, or the more we can look at at how we tend typically to interpret or make sense of things, the more we can do that from different angles and so forth, the, the thicker and the richer our, our internal worlds become on some level. Um, Andrew, are you saying that we have like five or six stories and we fit ourselves into these yeah, five absolutely. stories and all sorts of people, but we tend to say the same thing? We, we tend, no, I'm not saying we say the same thing. I think we reinvent ourselves depending on the circumstances of the circumstance, yeah. but that um, we retell the same stories that fit our notion of what it's like to be a human being in the yeah. world. Yeah, well, for that, cultural yeah. Yeah, yeah, your culture, yeah, well, exactly. Well, that, um, um, when you do things, I can name the times when I've said things that I thought maybe, were, for example, were racist in my life. Um, and then you know, the way in which you change that story so that you don't have that horrible feeling of, oh my god, I just said that. Right, so you rewrite that narrative. So it's memory plays a really significant yeah. role in how we change those narratives. It's like well, internalizing the audience. Yeah. Well, and another another context for students anyway is they're creating the stories in the context of being evaluated. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like when yeah. you remove the fact that they're yeah. generating stories in class That's for which right. they're going to be marked. Yeah. 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 There might like, be a whole other thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. You, you tell stories that fit the listener. Yeah, exactly. Or the listeners the shape what mm -hmm. what tell us. Yeah, that's exactly it. My students who are in online classes tell different stories. I'm always struck by my father, whose favorite line was to make a long story short, <laughs> uh, and that's when we need to run, yeah. right? Because it was it was a it was it's a significant statement. Hmm. It's going to be a long story. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I was. No, I'm yeah. um, I'm not clear with what I'm trying to ask. But one of the things that I play with around reflective practice is that we think that we're reflecting on our practice as educators in particular ways. Yep. And often they're entrenched in ideological understandings of how the world works. Okay. And I think in some ways story or narrative or adult development does the same thing. We tell our stories based on what, about our, ourselves and our development into adulthood in particular ways or particular lenses and often they're not, we don't always have that critical lens and how do we, and so, there are scripts or yeah. templates that we sort of default to yeah. and without critiquing yeah. what those templates or scripts are. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and I so think that per, per, uh, you mentioned adult education. There was a, an old time <laughs> adult guy named uh, Jack Mesero. Yes. Perspective transformation. I was thinking well, about that's this. right, and that's exactly where I'm thinking. It's Patricia Cranton and transformative yeah, learning, exactly. and that's where where, where Mesero would have been. Yeah. Um, and his idea was that if you didn't find ways to reflect on yourself, you, you have to, to, to change, to, to grow, to develop, to do that kind of development, you have to go through what he would argue would be a perspective transformation, yeah. right? You have to change the way you see your worldview. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that we can't necessarily force ourselves to that's do. That's right. Sometimes it happens when you travel. And often it happens in crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from crisis. And I think the therapeutic process can also involve perspective transformations, meaning perspectives being transformed. Yeah. yeah. I didn't ask a very good question, it's my own fault. It's a rich, it's a rich. Yeah. These are more along, first is more observation or indifference. Um, every person is born into life as a blank page and you have a bit of a struggle with that. I have more of a struggle with the end. Yes. Every person leaves us a full book. Good there's, question, yeah, good there's point. There's no sense of incomplete, yeah. sort of life cut short. Yes, mm -hmm. I like that. And, yeah. Or a premature death, or whatever it may or be. Or the lives that we might have lived. Yes. That on some level are always rumbling around in our, in our minds. And then or the know. idea that there's an epilogue being written after we die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a... Yeah. So, so there's from both ends that, yeah. that like, which is a catchy phrase. Yeah. But it deserves to be uh, stepped back from a little bit. I wanted to ask you about the one like um, you had, you write this, and I'm not sure if you mean it as literally, and maybe you do. My identity is the story that I tell or retell about my life. Hmm. Whereas I have a real struggle with my identity here. Mm -hmm because I am seen by being, say, a math person, mm -hmm. or yeah. it's the identity that others tell about my life yes. becomes my identity. Yes. And so I'm wondering how we reconcile this idea, or are we talking about two totally different No, I, I think that's very, uh, some of the other stuff I've written, I played around with like, this idea that the inside story, the, the inside out story, and the outside in story, I could go, but, but what I'm trying to say in that is that, yes, uh, other people have versions of what our story is, and uh, come hell or high water, they're going to put those versions onto us, mm -hmm. and we have to either, you know, accept them or debate them or push them away or negotiate with them in some way. But that happens as soon as we're little kids. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you might grow up in the family, and oh, you're Johnny, uh, you're the, the boy, you're the one who's going to be the priest or going to be the doctor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so other people, parents in this case, are, you know, for the best of intentions, perhaps imposing a story, a version of us on us, it's not necessarily going to jive with who we understand ourselves to be as that unfold. Mm -hmm. So that, that negotiation, I think, I mean, you could look at uh, social psychology. I think of uh, uh, Irving Goffman's classic book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Yeah. And I would love to, to have a chance to rewrite that, throwing in the narrative variable, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which I think would be probably easy to do, uh, because we're always playing to an audience on some level. Uh, we're adjusting our stories, whether we realize on some level to, to connect with our listeners or to make a certain impression on our listeners and so forth. So that our awareness of their stories of us, which may be wrong, sometimes we have the wrong-headed ideas that what that person's story is of us, but it's always kind of, I think, operating in our mind in some way. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Can I see a hand up? I was looking at you on that. Me. Okay, good. I think I remember where I was, where I was trying to go. So I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about adult development theory, in that when when I think of adults and how they tell the stories about themselves, and I and and I study transitions to adulthood, so I'm really interested in that and how how young people make stories about tell stories about being adults, okay. what it means to be an adult. But that you can't how they anticipate in the That's right. okay. and, and in the transition that they, they see that they're making towards what they would call adulthood. I think it's a messy, messy space. Yeah. But one of the things that became really clear is that they can't identify themselves outside of the social. So, for example, in my own research, the notion of career becomes central, that you aren't an adult, adult until you know what you're going to hmm. do. And then you are, and I would say that as an adult, your relationship to your stories is always situated through the, the primary question we ask everybody at a dinner party, so what do you do, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and so I'm sort of still stuck in the ways in which identity are integrally linked to the social structures that affect yes. your life. Yep. And, the, and the paths that are sort of put out there for us as acceptable ways to, to, to live our life right. and grow into adulthood. 
we have to we have to negotiate with those. Sometimes we do it more consciously and defiantly uh, than than other people do. Um, I am not going. To, that I'm aware of that career path. Well, I was going to say something about the Trump family, but I'm not. Going well, to Trump, and Trump's a big one right now, right? Like yeah. that's exactly the I think the cognitive dissonance that comes with knowing that you live in a world that is run by crazy people is uh, pretty significant. Right, like I think about the, I'm thinking about the identity work that's happening right now amongst large numbers of people yeah. who are like, this isn't the world I thought I knew. Yes. Yeah. And then the people of color, the people of minority size, are saying, this was the world we knew. Why didn't you see it? Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, so the, to me, those are really interesting, dissonant ways in which to think about. Sounds like an interesting paper there. So yeah. You might want to to write, throw in some narrative stuff there, and, yeah. uh, and uh, see where that goes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. It's been a long time. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about CERN? What, what, what do you, oh. who, who are you? Where do you? Which, okay. Which CERN? What are your backgrounds? What yes. goes on there? In 2008, at St. Thomas University, um, we were able to get mon uh, funding from SHRC uh, for three years under the Aid to Small Universities program to start a narrative center because we made the claim that we had quite a bit of interest in and uh, experience with narrative ideas and wouldn't, say, wouldn't a liberal arts university be a great place to, to capitalize, uh, to, 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 to develop a center about a topic that is implicitly interdisciplinary. When I say that, I mean when, 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 I, when somebody says, well, what was that novel about? Well, it was about a whole bunch of things. War and peace is about war, it's about peace, but it's about love, it's about prejudice, it's about the whole thing. And narrative is it's kind of like that, it's implicitly interdisciplinary. So, hence, uh, we, we established the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative, which is a mouthful and collapses into the acronym CERN, which is not to be confused with that place in Switzerland. Okay? But uh, we, then we were able to build upon that, start the, the journal Narrative Works, and then uh, happily attract a, a short funding for a Canada Research Chair. In narrative studies. So to Clyde Baldwin, whom I mentioned before, is now the director of CERN. So it's it's not a big play. We don't have a we don't have a big uh, building just for CERN. But what's been kind of neat is over the last four or five years, or three or four years, we've had people coming from all over, mm -hmm. from Norway, from Spain, from wherever, coming to hang out and just sort of have a conversation and you know talk about their research projects. We talk about our research projects, and it's been kind of fun. Now, not terribly organized, maybe, but sort of fun. So that's what CERN is. Yeah. So are there opportunities to get involved in CERN? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. How? How? OK, come and talk to us. <laughs> and certainly <laughs> talk to my colleague, Clyde Balta, who is a Canada researcher at Jupiter. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, he has, and he, he's the, I think that he's the only CRC in narrative studies in Canada. Yeah. And maybe he's beyond that. I mean, he just, that's what he's all about. And he has a bright, very broad background in social work, dementia studies, and narrative theory, ethics and narrative. So we could have some conversation. And he also um, is on at least one of our students' dissertation things. So he's yes, involved. exactly. Exactly. He's, I think he's on a few dissertation committees. So. He's doing some fascinating projects on, on, on his own. So great for so yeah, come on over. Yeah, just across the couldn't be handier. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. And uh, hopefully you're able to stay. We have um, downstairs one floor and sort of down that way. Um, there's snacks. Um, coffee tea um, and hopefully a chance to connect uh, opportunity to connect some more closely um, maybe if people want to carry on the sure. some of the conversations that began here or follow up um, and of course everybody would be welcome to please eat up the food because uh, I think we're gonna have le leftovers and I'd rather there were less leftovers than more no, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, that, uh, my sister is going to get it. Yeah.